I did shoot about 35 to 40 guys that they know of. Um, What's going on, guys? Uh, welcome to the first episode of Cool Historians on YouTube and the 27th of the podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcast. For this first episode on YouTube, we'll have my friend as a guest. Uh, he is an ex-hitman of Gambino family, and he was one of the most trusted men of John Gotti after they had like a beef, I would say. And uh, his name, of course, he's Albanian too. His name is John Adita. John, thank you so much for being here with you. Follow me, dear. Shum respect. So, uh, very nice to be here. I'm glad I was looking forward to this. So, John, to start with the first question for you, I know that you like the direct questions. My question for you is, how is it possible that you are so brave to uh, expose government and mafia on social media? Are you not afraid someone can attack you? You know, a lot of times I talk about what's what's the right thing to do in life, right? And and what's going on in Canada now? Uh, a lot of people are intimidated there, or they're not uh, educated enough to understand what's going on. And uh, when you watch the government talk about defunding the police, and I speak up for the police being an ex-gangster, and uh, they risk their lives, but the problem is a lot of times you have people like a lot of the police now, they now are protecting the same people that try to defund them, the same people that try to take their livelihoods, and the same people that are going against freedom. So, you know, you got to stand up and somebody has to be the voice of reasoning and somebody's got to risk themselves. So I believe it's for the better good what I'm doing now. Before was a crazy life that wasn't for good. This is for good. So um, I'm never going to stay quiet if I can help uh, people and, and support, especially the truckers that were out there, you know, protesting for freedom uh, peacefully, not like the Marxist movement they had with BLM. That has nothing to do with black lives. Uh, people don't have the understanding what BLM is. And the organization is a Marxist organization against freedom. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little later about this. So we're going to have like for me, maybe 15 minutes about this because it's a very hot topic right now. It is a very important topic to talk about. But anyways, uh, I remember in Goodfellas, there is a famous quote of Ray Liotta that he says, for me, being a gangster was better than being the U.S. president. Was it the same for you when you were young? Uh, yeah, you know, listen, Goodfellas was a movie that people watched and they enjoyed it. That's guys from my neighborhood. Uh, Robert De Niro plays Jimmy Burke. Jimmy Burke's son, Frankie Burke, was a very good friend of mine. Uh, we stayed together together. Uh, I'm the guy that went to identify him when he got killed with his sister. So uh, when I look at these things, uh, I'll tell you one thing. The American mafia and the Italian mafia does not go against their country. You know, you could say a lot of things about the mafia, but they do not talk anti-America and what's going on. And so when people like Leota make those statements, it's true. We have respect in those days, especially of being very loyal to our countries, the way I am still to Albania and to America. Uh, we believe in our bloodline. And, and I think that that statement is uh, the, the way people really treat us. Interesting, interesting uh, view. Uh, let's start from the beginning. How was being raised in an Albanian immigrant family? You know, Again, I lost a lot of the language. I understand a lot of Albanian people don't realize how much I can understand, but I can't uh, speak as well. Uh, I can write a little bit still. But I was raised in a family with uh, Albanian flags in the house, the flamu, uh, Albanian music. I had my grandparents in my house, my aunt and uncles upstairs, my hubla downstairs, uh, my cousins across the street. I was, I was raised in a very... Uh, Albanian-oriented family as with the old uh, structure and family values. So um, I think growing up like that, I never lost the values of our country. John, what was the reputation of the mafia in your hood, in your neighborhood? Because when I think about mafia, I think of the movie, for example, Bronx Tale, when uh, mafiosos were like, mobsters were very rich and very powerful in the hood. What was the reputation of the mafia when you were young? 
you know, I grew up in, you know, in the 60s. So you're talking about a different era. So the mafia was very strong. You know, my father was grew up on Delancey and Rivington Street in New York with Lucky Luciano and, and Vito Genovese. They were all from the neighborhood of Seward Park. And so, you know, he was raised in that. And he brought me into a neighborhood where uh, it was exactly that. I worked in a, in a delicatessen candy store where all the gangsters hung out and, you know, they used the phones for uh, sports business. And we all stood on corners in those days. So I was around the mob since I'm a baby and guys like Fat Andy Ruggiano, who was Albert Anastasia's guys. People always bring up Gotti, but Gotti doesn't come into my life till 20 years later. I was around some other people that were serious bosses in the mafia. I was raised on their lap. So um, mm -hmm. it was just it was a, it was a big neighborhood for gangsters where we grew up. But all New York was back then. What was your first job for Gambino family? I'd say what is your first uh, collect, collecting money, sending notes, uh, sending uh, paperwork, sports paperwork uh, back and forth to bookmakers and picking up money, things like that, errand stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first uh, interaction with the John Gotti Sr.? Uh, what was your impression? Well, I already knew who he was. He started having a name. He went to prison and he got out in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, when he came home, Uh, Fat Andy Ruggiano, who was on their family since I'm a kid. I'm still friends with Anthony through, you know, people see us together. Actually, we're traveling together uh, in a couple of weeks to California. Uh, we're doing a TV show together. But uh, I was around that family. And when he was going to prison, he had a 20 year sentence to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Gotti took his position. So we, we were all transferred over to Gotti in those days. So I remember the first time I met him in front of the club. Yeah. I mean, he was very... Uh, Uh, chris, charismatic guy, a powerful guy in our neighborhood, well liked, well respected. So it was, you know, as a kid, you look up to these guys. You don't look up to ball players. You look up to gangsters. But how did you manage to become one of the most trusted men and one of the, I would say, best hitmen of the of the families in uh, in New York? Like, what were the goddess rules to also to quote the the book that George Anastasia wrote about you? Well, the, the thing is with the mob, if you, you know, I'm not a guy that just came along like people on some of the, you know, people say in some of the interviews, they think I started there. I was raised around all the mob for, since I'm a baby, since I'm literally four and five years old. I was in, you know, dens of, of mob games and, you know, I, with my dad. And then later on with my baseball coach, whose father was the, the boss. So when I was with Albert and Anthony Ruggiano, I'm around these gangsters since I'm a kid, so I'm well trusted. By the time I get along with the Gottis, I'm already have a reputation of being violent uh, and having Albanian blood. I mean, we 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 raised with uh, a lot of uh, violence in our culture yeah. because of uh, you know our history of communism, suppression, yeah. the Kosovo Serbian War, and and different things, and no money like most immigrants when they come to this country. You're coming and you're, you're uh, trying to make your way. And when you come here, uh, you become very aggressive. And, you know, my family was aggressive and I became aggressive. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a little spicy question. If you want, you can, you don't have to answer it, but... Uh, I answer all questions. You can ask me anything. <laughs> How many people have you killed, John, or have you shot at least? Uh, you know, there's an article that came out in Forbes magazine. And mm -hmm. I tell people uh, that's the prosecutors, the FBI, got his own attorney. And uh, in that article, they said that I did shoot about 35 to 40 guys that they know of. Um, and I baseball batted, like I said. I mean, listen, this was my job. I did this every day. I went out and I hurt people. And unfortunately, uh, it took a toll on my life. And, uh, you know, you don't keep a count. I don't keep a, an exact scorecard. But you know you're out there and this is what you're doing every day. So I don't have a lot of respect for guys that are, are – uh, big mouths or, or, or people that talk nonsense. Again, we come from a culture where I think that, you know, you have a lot of people like that we look up to, like, you know, me, Scandal Bale, like most of us, like, uh, you know, the pri ex prime minister of Kosovo, who was uh, a war hero and became the prime minister Ramush. I look up to these people that put their life out there and uh, sacrifice themselves Uh, you know, for for our country. I thought that I was doing something, sacrificing myself for something. I believed it. So it came natural to me because of the way we were raised. Mm -hmm.
it comes down all to the to the how you were raised in the immigrant family, right? Yeah, you know, you, you you learn not to talk so much, but to be more by your actions, not mm. by your words. You know, and and you know, as life goes on with me, uh, I move my life in a different direction. So, you know, it, it, it is my past, whether I like it or not. So, you know, I just try to be honest about it, and uh, I try to go in a different direction. Tell those kids not to do what I used to do. Obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, as as much as I live that life, but there's other opportunities that I didn't have, I guess, back then. And those that now uh, there's a lot more opportunities for the people that are here in America. Can you tell us a, a crazy story that happened to you when you were in the mafia world? I mean, listen, I, on a regular basis, people try to kill me. So uh, I, I've told so many different stories. At, at one time I was, I was coming home and we robbed uh, Colombian drug dealers mm -hmm. and they uh, tried to machine gun me off the, wow. off the corner by my house. Um, but you know, those things, you know, you look back as a young guy, it didn't really, it didn't really bother me. You know, I didn't lose any sleep about it because this is my life. And you think you're invincible when you're young, when you're older. Now you look back and you say, how many times guys try to kill me? They stabbed me up or they shot me. And, you know, and you go to the hospital, you get, you're in a hospital either a couple of days, a couple of weeks, depending. Well, you know, when I got stabbed up, I was stabbed up pretty bad. I was in and out of hospital for a year. So, the, you know, I got baseball batted. I got dragged with a car. I mean, I was really hurt bad on that. But, you know, those things happen if you're in the street. It's just part of it. It's not a one-way street where you're only giving. You you might be hurting a lot of people, but people are also trying to kill you, too. There's a lot of tough guys on the street. But what was the moment that you said to yourself, like, you know what? Now I'm dead. You're almost, you almost died in that moment. I don't think I ever said that. I mean, I, I, I had a guy click a gun outside of the mafia in California. I was there and clicked the gun in my face and it didn't go off. And I was with a couple of guys and we were fighting and I got the gun from the guy and he started running away and I shot at him and it went off. So sometimes there's a lot of luck. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends got killed over the years and uh, were shot up and, you know, it takes a lot of luck and maybe God that's, it, you know, has a, different path for you for some reason so uh, you know i believe that also and uh i i just think that it's just part of you know you don't really say uh, i sh y you don't look at it that way you it's just part of going to work every day mm -hmm. uh, a beef is happening right now in the mafia social world i would say between you and sammy gravano but before that uh, sammy had a lot of respect for you to be honest so, and also he called you the perfect gangster. Let's hear it out, what he said. We are back. Uh, now, John, what do you think made uh, Sammy change opinion about you? 
because I'm not like most guys. I'm not weak. So when he says something that's not that I don't like or I don't agree with, I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. So I'll say it again. Now, he's a cunt. He's a fucking coward. He's another big mouth that didn't do much. Now, people are going to say, well, he was an underboss, you know, buddy. So I'm going to tell you, you can ask people or research, what did this man do to get to be to the level of being a made man? So people think because they're a made man that they did something spectacular to get there. He didn't do any kind of robberies because he went through that on his shows. He did some bullshit like almost children, kid stuff, the robberies. He shot a gun once prior to him being coming a made guy. And he shot one person out of 19 out of his own mouth. So he shot maybe two people and, and he lived off that his whole life. And he tells you about how tough he is. He set up murders. If you're that tough, after you cooperated, you wouldn't have hid in Arizona. He loves Brooklyn. He's from Brooklyn, but yet he's hiding in another state under, like I say, like Bin Laden in the mountains. So to me, he's a fucking coward with another big mouth. You know, he's an older guy now. He ain't no tough guy. He can bullshit everybody else. These guys that live over reputations are doing one or two things, and then they con everybody. So they don't sit with me because I'm very straightforward the way I talk, because I'm going to talk in detail. Let's talk about what you did. I'm going to ask him, let's, let's tell us how you got to be a made guy. Tell me what you did to get there. Tell me while you were a made guy, did you go out and shoot anybody by yourself? Did you fight three guys by yourself? Did you go out and put a bat in your hand by yourself? Did you go do a robbery by yourself? Did you did you ever do anything without being a coward and shooting somebody in the back of the head with 10 guys by you know besides that? Because anybody can do that. But did you put yourself in harm's way? Were you intelligent enough to make money without a group of guys? These guys can't survive without being in their neighborhoods where everybody knows them, where they got 20 guys with them. But if they're alone, they're not going to survive. If they're in another country, forget about another jail like I was in, like Brazil. So I don't give a fuck what stupid title they give themselves. It doesn't mean anything to me. And you got to remember, they're going to attack me because I'm an Albanian putting down the guys that I don't like in the Italian mafia, who I think are just weak. I think they're cowards. And when I had a little more understanding of Sam Rigovano and his history, because I wasn't friendly with him, in the mob days, I was Gotti's guy, not him. And when he started opening his mouth, then I started attacking him after I researched a little bit more about him through his friends. Interesting. Uh, you and uh, John Gotti Jr. were best friends when you were around. Yeah. They were best friends. I mean, the, the, I was with them a lot. The father had me next to him. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were friendly, yeah. Mm hmm what was the moment that you said between me and uh, John Gotti Jr. has nothing left? Like When they, first off, you know, a, a lot of the mob guys, they like to talk to guys that are around them like they're dogs or they're peasants. And, you know, again, I'm going to talk about Albanian culture. Mm -hmm. We ain't going to accept that. That's not just me. That's just our culture. We're not going to let anybody talk to us like we're, we're beneath them. So if you respect me, I'll respect you. As he he got into a position because of his father, same thing. These guys get into positions that, in my opinion, they're not even close to deserve because they're not out there. They didn't grow up in poverty like I do. Or I talk a lot about the neighborhood kids from over where I grew up, the Spanish and black, because these guys grew up like me. We don't grow up with anything in our hands. We don't have no money like in Albania. You know, three quarters of the country is broke. So yeah, when you yeah. when you come from a hard life, you're legitimately from the street, whether you like it or not. And then you can do it the right way, come out of the street, or you can do it the wrong way. So these guys are starting off with, you know, with spoons in their mouth, what we call silver spoon. So I think that as he elevated, he forgot who he was talking to. He wasn't talking to one of these guys that go get your car or somebody that cares that your father was the boss. I'm a guy that's loyal to them to an extent, but when you try to abuse that loyalty, then yeah, it cuts things off. I read uh, yesterday, I read uh, Forbes, the, the one that you, you, you talked about before, the Forbes uh, article about you. Yeah. And it said that uh, actually John Gotti Jr. was uh, was talking to the FBI way before you did. But how it's, like how do you explain that? And how, how do you think they, they managed to change the story, at least for the TV, for the media? Because I'm John Alita, right? Albanian 
from an Albanian immigrant father. He's John Gotti's son, who John Gotti was the famous boss. Now, in the media, they did put in the front covers of the newspapers that he was, you know, ratting and cooperating and and giving information against guys and, you know, whatever word you want. He was a spy. Uh, and he spins it and says uh, he didn't put anybody in jail. That's a complete lie. That when you're giving information against guys, there's investigations that lead down the pike that gets guys locked up all over. Plus, Danny Marino couldn't get a bail. He couldn't get out of jail because of his testimony. Uh, other politicians got arrested and different people got indicted over the years. But I, I understand why John did it. Uh, you know, for me, now I'll talk about John Gotti Jr. His whole crew of, of, of wise guys and made guys, captains, they were all testifying against him. And he did go to trial. And I guess at, at a certain point when I was in a penitentiary in Brazil, he didn't want to sacrifice his life anymore because these guys were turning on him. And he betrayed himself and he betrayed me by going to meet with the FBI mm -hmm. while I was in the penitentiary. Now, over the years, they try to change those facts. But those facts are facts. I'm in a penitentiary. He's meeting the government. I wasn't talking. That's why I was in a penitentiary on the run. I was using John Gotti Sr.'s lawyer, Richie Raybach, all the way till the 2000s. So if you are talking... Everybody would know about it. I used him. I used another mob lawyer called Mike Pinsky. I used mob attorneys. So everybody knew I wasn't talking. And then when I went to Brazil on the run, if you are snitching, if you are a spy, you don't run. You just come in and you keep all your money and you don't run. No way. You don't stay in a Brazilian penitentiary for two and a half years and spend millions of dollars fighting cases. So that nonsense is for people that are uneducated, that don't understand this life. Or it's for people that are fans of those guys. And they, you know, they, they'll go against you no matter what the truth is. And at this point, I say the same thing. I've let this go for a year and more. And the family's still talking about me. They're never going to stop. The sister doesn't stop because she really has no life. When people have a life and they move forward, uh, she wasn't sitting down discussing mob business. No different than Albania. We don't tell, tell the woman anything. You know, we do our thing on the street and, you know, we don't discuss this. So her information is coming from nowhere. It's ridiculous. And facts and timelines can't change. So uh, you're never going to stop them. And, I, you know, I just said, you know, they're not Gotti's rules. They should have, my author should have put these are elite as rules. You know, you screw me, I'll screw you back double. You know, you're not going to get away with screwing me. I'm not, I'm not a weak guy. And I came right back to my neighborhood. So when people are talking that nonsense, I'll say the same thing. They want you to do something about it, you know, but I don't live that life anymore. And they know that. But mm -hmm. if they live the life, they should kill me then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but do you have any respect for the mobsters that used to work with at least? Uh, any yeah, I, there's a lot that I respect. There's a lot that I'm friendly with that I say hello, goodbye to. You know, it's not what people think. Uh, I don't agree with their lifestyle anymore. You know, obviously, I'm in a different direction with my life, but they, they're they grown men. They can choose what they want. There's a lot of tough mobsters out there. There's a lot of guys that I do think are tough guys. I just don't bring their names to the forefront. Uh, there's guys that uh, there's one guy just recently that retired that was uh, a, a name in a mob for years, uh, Patty De La Russo. Uh, and uh, I wasn't sure if he really retired. And I just met somebody else. Uh, a guy that was in jail with me that was a cousin of, of a, a best friend of mine that passed away that was a, a bank robber gangster, and he told me he passed away. But these kind of guys, because a little more intelligent, I do respect them. I, I did like them. Uh, but, you know, there's not – I would say I don't like 70 or 80% of them I said because 70 or 80% of them are completely fake. They never did much. Uh, they don't know how to make money. They didn't, they're not gentlemen. So it, to earn respect, you need a couple of things from me. You got to be intelligent. You got to be a nice guy and you got to be a, a, a capable, tough guy without the bullshit of five guys with you. So that doesn't uh, to me, that doesn't amount to being a tough guy. Five guys. Now, John, in the retrospective, if you never met John Gotti Jr., if you never were part of a Gambino family and you uh, continue at university, how how different the life would be for you? You know, there's so many things you could do in life. You don't even have to go to university. If you're good at one thing in this world, one, if you're good at laying 
concrete. If you're good as an electrician, you can get rich and wealthy. So, you, or if you're, you, you don't have, you could be a, a truck driver, you can be a UPS driver. You know, I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Here they have UPS. So, for the people in other countries where you can invest your money, you can get a good uh, a 401k package, you can invest in stocks, you can buy a home. And at the end of 15, 20 years, you can be a multimillionaire just being a smart guy going to work. So, the, the things that I chose, I didn't know better at that time. Mm-hmm. A lot of the kids in my neighborhood I talk to now because they don't know better. We didn't have, you know, I had an immigrant father that didn't go to school and he didn't understand to tell me I could do other things. I didn't just have to go to school. But if I stayed in school, yeah, I would have been successful doing something. I was a successful businessman. I knew how to make money. I know how to make money still today. I came back home broke and I'm, you know, I'm out there making money again and I'm doing well, but you don't need crime to do it. And you don't need your ego. And, and the problem is people are always challenging my ego. And I, years ago, mm-hmm. I, I got a different life now, a different path. Do you regret uh, leaving baseball? Because for people that don't know, you're in a baseball scholarship in university, right? I love baseball. I just had a, a, you know, I have a show for the people that don't know, the Elite Show mm-hmm. on YouTube and Spotify, Apple and all the, all the, uh, the uh the platforms there the platforms that you can watch it and i just had a young guy uh ben that's a pitcher trying to be pro and he should be i think this saturday we're putting up his story of baseball and i analyze baseball and i analyze uh the, the you know different sports i have some boxes on i had a ufc fighter that just he's an albanian guy in atlantic city Denise, dennis yeah. uh, you know so dennis bouchard so he just won a tough fighter he's a friend of mine So there's so many ways you can be successful without mm-hmm. going into the street and uh, hurting people and and basically killing yourself when you're on the street. You're gonna have a rotten life on the street. Short term, you might make some money, but long term, you're gonna just destroy yourself and your family. Mm-hmm. Now, John, I want to change the subject in the thing that you really like to talk about. I know that you're very active on social media, but before going into this subject, I want to put an intro. Uh, Margaret Atwood is a Canadian writer, and she said that democracy is very fragile, so the citizens should protect it. What do you think about the whole political situation that is happening right now in U.S., Canada, Russia? You have like maybe 10 minutes, whatever, uh, how much you want to talk about it? Well, first of Russia, Putin, I respect Putin. You might not agree with his ideologies of how he yeah. runs his country, but as an American now, as an Albanian, that family came from a communist country. Mm-hmm. We understand what dictatorships do. We understand communism. Yeah. We understand the manipulation of socialism. Mm-hmm. And to, to get these things, you get countries like Canada now with Trudeau, who, you know, he's taking, he's trying to take the freedoms away from the people, the Canadian people. Mm-hmm. And there is no second amendment in Canada, which is a problem. The, the right in the United States to bear arms. And the forefathers in, in the United States developed this constitution, this, this act, because they understood government will try to abuse their power. And if they do, he wanted the people to be able to be armed to protect themselves. So when you have police officers that are supposed to be protecting and serving their community, instead they're attacking them where they're doing, where they're protesting free speech and attacking women. And I watch a police officer push around a five foot old man, slap them, drag them. Uh, that's a coward. And if they don't understand history during Germany and Hitler, when they said we're just following orders, there's orders as a police officer. And then there's orders to God and the, and the rights of people and freedom. And if you're not on the right side of that, one day you never know, you can end up to being a Mussolini like in Italy when they hung him in the court. So when you got a guy like Trudeau who's a fucking coward and he's a he's a he's a, a bitch, and you're and the people in Canada can't talk the way we can talk, that man, whether one day he's gonna have to set, face the music, whether it's to a human being or to God for what he's doing. And when he sits there on television and praises China, communist China, that genocides people, slaves people, and talks about the respect he has for them, your countrymen 
and everybody in Canada should wake up. This has nothing to do with mandates and vaccines. This is a fear tactic to control emergency acts to, to, to submiss people mm -hmm. into submission. And when people understand how dangerous this is, uh, they really need to wake up and protest everything they're doing there for their freedom. Or they're not going to have families and children to have a good life. I I think same as you in, in some point, in some extent, because uh, the freedom to talk and freedom to, to have your... That, that's why also I'm letting you to talk about this, because it's the freedom to talk about this stuff. Uh, we shouldn't stop people for talking their mind. This is This is what at least my grandparents fought off and maybe your grandparents still fought off in Albania. Let me, I'll, I'll explain something to you, Luca. Yeah, tell me. Basketball in the United States is 82% black, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, should we consider that a racist sport because they're 82% black? These are ridiculous statistics. They are the 82% of the best b basketball players out there. Mm-hmm. The owners of the teams and the people that watch the game want to see the best play. That doesn't mean let's get rid of 40% of the players because we got to add some Arabic, we got to add some Chinese, we got to add some white. Yeah, so sure. when, when they start throwing these statistics out in different ways, the governments to manipulate people into division, right? Yeah. That's when you know that they're trying to break freedom. And when people are stupid enough to fall for this, because when I grew up with my friends, they were every color, every religion. They were Muslim like my family. Yeah. None of us cared. We, we go to the schoolyard. We play ball. We like each other. For whatever reason, we hang out with each other. When you start dividing people and saying this person, white privilege, I'll give you an example. When someone sees a stupid term like white privilege, I'm going to use a black woman, Joy Reid, that's on TV every day, that tries to cause division and race, racist uh, attitudes towards each other. Now, we weren't born white privilege. We were born from a Muslim communist country. Yeah. That, uh, our families were suppressed through communism, through the Ottoman days, through uh, my father came here, had no money. So, But if you look at Joy Reid, I believe she went to Harvard. She's a black woman. She's making millions and millions, and she's trying to cause the kids from my neighborhood to hate each other on skin color. So who's stupid enough to believe that? Because to have racist. power, you have to have division. So if you don't let them divide you, they have no power. They lose their power. And that's, the, that's basically what they're trying to do. They're trying to do exactly how I grew up in a mob. Mob people try to intimidate and make people afraid so they can control you by fear. And that's what these governments are trying to do now. They're trying to make people afraid. They're using the pandemic. They're using, they're allowing them to go out in the street, burn down the city, uh, defund the police. And then you have the police that are weak that come right back and work for those same people that were attacking them. So instead of having their mind say money is not more important than my pride and, and the, the, uh, the freedom of our families after I'm gone. Because a guy like me, as you're getting older, you're not going to be here forever. But we have children, grandchildren, and our grandchildren's grandchildren. You want them to have opportunities and a good life. Mm -hmm. Under the rules of these guys like Trudeau, he thinks that no one deserves a good life. He thinks only he does. And he thinks he's going to dictate. But there's people like, like I said, like Mussolini that got hung in the streets in Italy for the same reasons. So, you know, maybe we're not in those days, but there's also still a lot of crazy people out there. So when they do things like that, they should think about all those nuts that are out in the street that may it only takes one to do something stupid and attack them. Not that we want that to happen, but Absolutely you not. never know. Absolutely and and when they're taking advantage of people like this, eventually people fight back. We should we should be very careful with the division of people. It's very it's very true. This racism exists, but we should be very careful how we treat that. Remember one thing too. People are out there. Go to a schoolyard. Wherever you live, go to a park, wherever you live, I don't care what city, what country, what neighborhood, and go to those parks and just look around at little kids playing with each other, three, four, five, six years old. Not one kid looks at another kid and even thinks about their color or their religion. They just want to play and have fun and smile with each other. Very true. Very true. So they're teaching people to hate each other. And the more they teach people to hate each other, the more I go out 
and try to fight for people not to hate each other, people to get along with each other, people to look at each other the way we look at each other when we were kids. But I still have that belief, and I raise my kids that way. We don't have that belief. But the people that are, are doing that, people like Joy Reid, that, that is a Harvard spoiled brat, she's white privilege and she's black, so she's black privilege. So should we attack her and tell people, hate this woman because she has everything that we all want? Mm -hmm. You know, so people got to really look and analyze and tell people, stop letting people manipulate them. Don't let them use you as suckers and pawns. So uh, you want to end with a last message for young people, especially, and of course, Albanian ones? Yeah, listen, freedom of speech for young people around the world, everywhere, whether I agree with you or disagree with you, doesn't make who we are as a person. We should still respect each other, like each other. And if you think something different than, than I believe, so what? You're allowed your opinion. We can all like each other and disagree and respect each other's opinion. When they stop you from having an opinion or stop you to tell you you can't wear this shirt because he has the Albanian flag, you got to say to yourself, why are they trying to do this? This is just a manipulation of your freedom. And for the Albanian people, and, and where we come from in our blood, I there's so many famous, good people out there. Fidel, Fidel that's here. Barisha, that's a, a great photographer, is Albanian. You know, you have so many Albanian people that are successful. My friend, Dr. Gente Tuskezi, who's a neurosurgeon that's always with me. There's so many things in so many directions and the ability of, of people in our country, singers like Dua Lipa, Capital T, Any of these people that are out there successful, I'm hoping the Albanians that are listening to me, the younger people, mm -hmm. have an understanding. It may be difficult from wherever they are, but you can always be successful the right way. You don't got to ruin your life like I did and do 20 years in jail, basically, and you know, be shot up and stabbed up and fighting for your life and prison. That's not the way to live. You know, The way to live is, is doing some positive things. There's so many good people out there following them. Thank you so much, John. I enjoyed this episode. Thank you. I appreciate it. And everybody in Albania, see you.